This podcast episode is brought to you by OWC, Whisper Room, Spectra 1964, PreSonus Studio One, and Jay-Z Microphones. So get ready to rock. It's totally okay to have an outside job that's not music. And in fact, when I first moved to town, I was a valet for Lexus. Like, going and fetching cars is a great thing to do if you want to have ideas. It's almost better to be not working on music than to be working on music that you don't really like, that's occupying that space in your brain that would be thinking about music you do like. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you feel like the fast pace of computer tech has made your studio Mac obsolete, then think again. OWC is your personal studio tech for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs perfect for recording and mixing. Why ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with the Mac you've already got? Learn how to supercharge your studio and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC.com so that you can focus on making great music. If you're sick of bothering the neighbors when you're trying to record your music or ruining your recordings with outside noises, but you're not ready to spend a fortune on permanent studio construction yet, then consider getting a Whisper Room ISO booth for your studio. Whisper Room offers an instant solution for a comfortable, quiet, ventilated, portable ISO booth with easy line of sight for recording vocals, guitar amps, or even drums. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Cheyenne Metters, a singer-songwriter, producer, and musician living in Nashville, Tennessee, originally from North Georgia, taught guitar by his father, Cheyenne started writing songs and playing music with his brothers at a young, as a young teenager. In 2005, he actually moved to Nashville, which is back when I met him. Um, and he produces his own music and helps other artists bring their ideas to life, too, in the studio. Cheyenne co-wrote songs on the Secret Sisters Grammy-nominated album, You Don't Own Me Anymore, as well as Ward Thomas's UK number one album, Cartwheels. He collaborates with Ali Ferris as FM and Sarah Beth. Go as Geography, and his brothers Carson and Will Metters um, as The Metters. So that was the band, actually, I, I worked with Cheyenne and originally. He's a member of indie rock band The Nobility and produces lo-fi electronic music under the name Bell Bear. It's super cool stuff. He's a member of the Real Sword Music Collective in Nashville. Cheyenne runs a home studio called Departure Room and has produced, mixed, written on, played on, or otherwise worked on recordings by The Secret Sisters, Sarah Darling, The Colonel, James Paul Mitchell, Z Swan, Jude Smith, um, Circina, and, and many more. In 2019, he released three new singles from his upcoming full-length album, Sapphired Up, due out in February. Um, so that'll actually be out by the time we hear this. I actually met Cheyenne through his uncle's studio designed by Carl Tatz, who's been on the podcast in the past too. And um, that's where I, I was actually looking at the studio for some design ideas for my own. And that's where I got the idea of doing the loft above the control room, which really has been a cool thing here. Um, and I met Cheyenne, and we started working together, and now we're here on the podcast. So please welcome Cheyenne Metters to Recording Studio Rockstars. Cheyenne, dude, welcome back, and are you ready to rock? Yes, I am. Dude, it's great to have you back in the studio. It's been years. We used to do the stereo sessions here. I think that was the last thing we did, Yep. Um, which was my live video performance out of the studio. Uh, and that, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it was fun, man. And you just sounded so good doing that. You're such a natural— Thank you with an acoustic guitar and just singing, you know. Thank you so much. A, a real troubadour. What kind of verb were you using on those sessions? I remember just being immersed in it and really loving it. You know, it's a plate reverb. It's an echo plate, Probably too. A, a real one? A real one yeah. that's just sitting upstairs. Of course. And now you're reminding me I need to start using it more. I've been leaning on my plug-in so much, yeah. but I've got a real plate just sitting right there. Yeah. 
Not only that, but we would mic everything up with the bands. Um, in your case, we just use a single mic on you playing, singing and playing acoustic guitar. Yeah, I think I think so. Maybe kind of in between the guitar and the and the vocal. I like doing that. Yeah, well, it's a, if such get, a great sound for acoustic and mm-hmm. singing if you get the yep. right balance. Yep. Yeah, one of my songs on the new album um, is is like that. I just set up, I think it was like an Audio Technica 4050 and just kind of put it in the right spot, you know, like the right distance from the guitar and the voice. And then you don't have to mix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's nothing, to, there's you know, no mixing there's to no do. there's no phase weirdness, you know? Yeah, it's a very focused sound. Yeah. It's very like together sound, mm-hmm. which is nice. Um, the other thing that we would do for the stereo sessions is I wanted to keep all the stuff like live mixed down to stereo. Uh, so we would go through the console. I mean, with one mic, it was easy, but with bands, we do that too. And there's something about just mixing straight through the console and then just capturing the two track. And then there's nothing left to do but mix that just sounds yeah, it's unparalleled, like, you know? Yeah, it's like the... The engineer is a performer as well, kind of, you know, or a member of the band, you know. I wanted to be. If you watch watch my videos, you can tell I wanted to be. Sure. Myself in the videos a lot, right? Well, it's uh, uh, it it was it was a cool experience, and I think the uh, watching those videos back um, was just really neat. You know, I wish we could have done it ten more times. Maybe we will, man. Who says? Maybe so. Oh wait, some people said we can't, but we might do it again anyway. Yeah. Um, so you've done a lot of stuff here in Nashville. I remember when you moved here, um, you know, we were all younger then, but, Mm -hmm. um, you know, your uncle, Monty Powell had, had mentioned to me, who's a, who's a very successful songwriter here and done a lot of technically cousin, Oh, cousin, um, okay, because he's, he's like generationally, he would be what you would think of as an uncle, but he's, he's my dad's first cousin. So, but yeah. It's not one of those like he's my granddad and my younger brother at the same time. No, we we're we're from we're from one state over. Um, <laughs> nice. No, we're we're from. Yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let's see here. Um, talk a little bit about you know your background in music and and um, ending up in Nashville. You know, give us give us the the condensed like who's Cheyenne? How'd you get here? Well. Um, when uh, I guess when I was when I was a kid, I played sports and I liked sports and stuff like that. Um, but I was I was kind of a smaller kid, you know. And I you mean you were like a, like a, a a runt? You mean like smaller kid or no? I mean, well, I don't know. I, I was I was decent at sports, but like once I got to like middle school, I wasn't like going to be on the school teams or anything. Um, so I guess like music sort of occupied that space um, maybe that, that sports had. Um, so, my, so that means, so you would spend your time, is this sort of like during school, high school kind of times you're thinking? More of like bit? middle school is when I really got into music for the first time. Um, my, my dad's a musician, a songwriter, and we I was really immersed in, uh, really great music that I still love now. Growing up, you know, on the on the record player, on the stereo, um, a lot of Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Elton John, um, a lot of other stuff too. But and would you go see shows with your dad playing and well, have musicians over and that? The kind of first thing? concert. See, I I listened. I went through a spell of listening to country music too because in the nineties, my dad. Uh, had some success as a country songwriter. Uh, he would commute to Nashville, not commute. I mean, he would not like every day, but it, we he would drive to Georgia like a few times a year. And he cut his foot in the door with that was actually his cousin Monty, who was already building a a great career here in Nashville, producing um, and so- and writing and. A lot, a lot yeah, of country stuff, yeah, right? writing and eventually producing. Um, he produced a band that was huge in the country world uh, called Diamond Rio, right? In the early '90s, and uh, my dad and him had a co-write on their first album, and and it became sort of a sort of a hit for a little while. I mean, it was on the radio, 
And so I, I, when I was like nine or 10 years old, this is about 92, I would listen to country. And because I feel like, like country music, I don't think was my dad's favorite thing, but because he had a song on the radio and he was kind of in that world now, we started listening to the country radio. Um, so that was uh, like my, I guess what I was going to say, my first concert was Diamond Rio, you know, but we would also have like backstage passes and stuff like that. And I got to meet the members of the band when I was 10 and, and all that. And, um, and I, I, nowadays I run into them at the Opry and stuff like that, you know, like all these years later. So it's, it's fun. They're actually still a, still a band, the same, the same six members. Not bad to have a, a lifetime career out of the music you're doing. No, it's it's amazing. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of rambling with all that, but well, it, well, it's all right. Yeah. So, what, what's some stuff you remember liking about country uh, at that point in your life? What 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 impressed you about the music you were hearing? I think. Well, it's interesting. I liked country. I remember loving "Achy Breaky Heart" when it came out. I mean, I wasn't the only one that loved it. It became like the biggest song in the world for a while. And my dad, I don't think, liked it very much. Maybe it was just too goofy. Um, but as a 10 year old, I think just the pop hooks, which you can find pop hooks in pop music, country music, bluegrass music, any kind of music, you know, think things that, that really hook you in. Um, and then of course, Diamond Rio, just the virtuosity of that, you know, Jimmy Olander on the B bender, G bender guitar. I don't know how many strings he bends (laughs) with his strap. Um, yeah, why don't you actually explain uh, to the rock stars what a what a B bender and a G bender are? Because I, okay. I never even heard of such a thing until so, I was here in Nashville. So there's many ways to make a string like bend the note where you're not like sliding it like across frets, but it's going, you know, like a you can bend it with your finger, uh, obviously, and but but there's instruments like pedal steel guitar that have pedals that that bend the strings. Of course, there's whammy bars too. But pedal steel guitars do it really precisely. So you can actually, you know, hold the bar across the strings and press a couple pedals, and then you have a different chord, and and it's a really smooth transition. And it's I guess it's confusing because you hear bend the string. It doesn't really bend it. It it just it tightens stretches the string. It. It, yeah, you're it right. Like you're tunes right. it up to another note. Right? You're right. It's not the open string. Yeah, at that point you're not. Yeah, yeah, it's tightening the string. Um, it's making the frequency of the vibration higher. But it's silly even me talking about it, you know, just go listen to it because that, that's what it sounds like. But a B-bender is like taking the concept a little bit of a pedal steel and putting it into usually a Telecaster, but I guess you could do it with any guitar. Um, and it, I don't know exactly how they're made, but there's some sp- you you holler out part of the body and put some springs and moving parts and then you attach a lever to one of the strap ends so you can like when you're holding the guitar you kind of like push the neck of the guitar down and that lever uh tightens the b string usually you can set it to whatever but usually like up a step or the equivalent yeah, like a whole of two frets right? yeah so you can do a lot of those pedal steel licks, and it's you, you end up making it do that. Um, it would be similar to what you might want to bend the string to with your finger if you were going to try and do it with your finger, like exactly, bow, 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 yeah, exactly. Bow, bow, and you can spread. still bend with your finger, but um, you can uh, you can hold you can hold shapes down and kind of use the strap. It just gives you way more possibilities. Right, right, and right. it has a different sound than just bending because it it's just more, it's more fluid. You want the critical details from your microphone to get through to your recording and the Spectra 1964 101 amplifier provides just that. With unequaled headroom, low noise, and a linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks. Used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, and John Lennon, Spectra 1964 brings that same incredible sound to your studio with the new STX 600 mic pre with built 
built-in comp limiter. Start making classic records again at spectra1964.com. If you want a digital audio workstation that will give life to your music from sketching a new idea to composing, editing, mixing, and mastering a finished record, then you want Studio One from Presonus. Studio One is easy to use with intuitive drag and drop simplicity, making it great for beginners, yet flexible and powerful for experienced producers. Whether creating beats, recording a band, or composing a blockbuster film soundtrack, you will find everything you need to create your masterpiece. Download your free version of Studio One Prime and get started now at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. There was a guy that I worked with, um, Stephen Durr has been on the show, a studio designer, and his partner in Studio C at Woodland was um, Steve Hennig, who's, who's uh, down in Texas, um, and whose son actually just moved here in Nashville. Welcome. Um, and he, uh, so Steve told me a story because he had played banjo on the um, uh, Dukes of Hazard soundtrack way yeah. back in the day and had been part of that. And, and he had come up with this design for a six string bender guitar that was like, it was like a crazy $20,000 strat or something, which wow. actually sounds cheap compared to some old strats. Exactly. Now. Yeah, no. But it was like this crazy six pedal board that would lay down there and you'd play strat and then you just like hit all these different pedals and it would bend all the strings all kinds of different ways. So you'd have like pedals on the ground that would Yeah, and a, cra- so, and a cable. So you so the Air, same concept is like a like a bicycle brake. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. yeah. And it would just come up That's to the That's pretty guitar. wild. Yeah. And I, I think they got a prototype of it, but I don't know if it ever got into production or yeah, not. Yeah, it seems like a lot to get tangled up in. Cool stuff. Instrument building is so awesome. Mm-hmm. If you ever get the chance to just explore um, people who are designing like instruments that you've never even heard of, it yeah. gets fascinating really quickly. Yeah. Um, I remember there was a there was a book and a CD out. I mean, there probably there's probably something coming out every every so many years, but uh, probably back in the '90s, and it was like they were showing off all these different ones that were like, you know, instruments that people would blow into that were crazy looking things that looked like, you know, horns made out of radiator parts. And then um, somebody else was building something where you would bow pieces of wood and mm-hmm. you'd roll another piece of wood across it with frets on it. And it made all these crazy human voice sounds. Oh, yeah. Do you follow the, the account, the Instagram account, Dust to Digital? No. Oh, but man. I will now. I'm making a note of it. Oh, man. So they have a lot of like, I guess, archival footage of just old performances uh, by awesome people. But a lot of what they have is also like from other parts of the world where people in some village will just build an instrument out of, I don't know, just some bamboo pipes laying around or something. And they just make insane sounds. And you don't even know what year it's from, you know, but it's always some kind of grainy um, video um, and they're like, you know, minute long clips on Instagram. Yeah. And it, it's pretty, uh, pretty immersive. I, I, there's a lot I don't like about Instagram now, but that's one of the the great things about it is that account. Yeah. Well, Instagram, all the social media things, I think the thing that I tend to not like about them is the way that they derail you from, from or they derail me from whatever I was thinking of. Mm-hmm. You know, I go to them and, and, it, and it's sort of, they do. it's designed to sort of, trip me up on whatever my mission was it, in that moment. But it, they're so yeah. great as a way of delivering and sharing content. You know, like if you yeah. if you do want to create lots of little videos, um, uh, I, he came through the studio, but a Fair Hazel is an artist from England and he's been producing a short song and a short sort of Monty Python animation skit yeah, video to go great. accompany it. Every day, yeah. you know, as he travels across the U.S., and Instagram's the perfect thing for that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a wonderful platform. Uh, my feelings on social media, and really, I think I say this about smartphones sometimes, is like they're sort of like lightsabers in that you almost have to be disciplined as a Jedi to use them effectively. Otherwise, you know, if somebody untrained picks up a lightsaber and starts swinging it around the way that just anybody just kind of looks at their phone, you're going to cut your arm off or yeah, something. Yeah, cut your legs right out from under and, you. And that's, you know, that's how smartphones and uh, social media can just kind of cut off half of our day. <laughs> yeah, you know, indeed. Like, 
if you wake up the first thing in the morning, I forgot who said this, one of these motivational people, but like, make don't wake up in the morning, and I'm guilty of this, but don't wake up in the morning. The first thing you do is check your email or or uh, Instagram because all of a sudden, like all that potential you have from a brand new day is uh, is kind of pushed aside. And now your mind's thinking about all this other stuff, you know, like something Buzzing. somebody posted or or somebody that sent you an email that may not need to hear from you until that afternoon. But like if you wake up and if you get up before your family or if you live by yourself, you know, it's just whatever. But I love, you know, if I get up early before anybody else, going and grabbing a guitar or opening up a session and just like start fresh with something that's inside me. And that way you, you know, I'm sure that people on this podcast have mentioned The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, but his philosophy is like, there's this thing called resistance that keeps us from doing what we need to do. And if you can, if you can beat that every day, you know, that's the goal is to, um, is to actually do your work. I mean, it sounds mundane, but it's so easy to get distracted. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And uh, that seems like a good answer or a good topic to bring up um, as a segue to my usual question of uh, sharing an inspirational quote. Mm. Um, if you have anything else you want to share, please jump in. But but War of Art is a great book, Stephen Pressfield's book. He I guess he wrote Bagger Vance was the the film script that the, he wrote yeah, that became a big movie, movie yeah. a golf movie of yeah. all things. And um, but it's it's a really inspirational book, and it does talk about like compartmentalizing time for yourself to do your work and your writing, and you got to be willing to go in there and um, write crap on the days where you're just not feeling it, but you're oh, there yeah. anyway, showing up. That's you know? the thing, yeah. Yeah, em- embrace the failures, you know, write, write the crap. I-, I think, well, we can get into this later, but so the, the quote, I think, I mean, there's a lot of great quotes, but I think the one I actually wrote down is from The War of Art. Um, nice. Our job in this life is not to shape ourselves into some ideal we imagine we ought to be, but to find out who we already are and become it. Ooh, I love that, man. Yeah. That is the hardest damn thing. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, that and just like knowing what you want are the hardest things because there's so many things around us, you know, to compare ourselves to and be like, be like this. Hey, I got 200 and whatever episode number we're up to now. You know, we've got some 230 something podcast episodes that, um, the rock stars are listening to right now that perhaps they've been comparing themselves to. And um, it's such a great encouragement and a reminder that like every one of you who's out there listening right now, like all you need to do is just do the you thing. And that's going to be yeah awesome. Yeah. And it's not an excuse to be like lazy and, and not grow. You know, it's like we're, we're all seeds. We're all like trees that need to grow. Um, so it's not like, um, well, I don't need to be as good as these other people. I can just be me and just like do my thing and not and not get any better. It's not about that. It's like no, discover what you are and cultivate that. And that it's really applicable in music and recording because it's like it doesn't mean not to learn from other people. It's you know? almost like we can compare you. Don't compare yourself to others, but it's cool to compare yourself to yourself. Well, sure. Yeah. Where were you a year ago? Um, that can it, be a little it, tricky as you get older sometimes. Because, <laughs> you know, I go back and listen to some banjo playing I did in my 20s, and I'm like, my fingers don't move yeah, the same way good. right now, you know? <laughs> Although partly yeah. that's just like that reminder yeah. that when the guitar is an instrument that you pick up intensely and then put down for a while and then pick up intensely— it's just like training for a 5K mm-hmm. race or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to you have to warm up again. Like every time I have a three-day session here with with my band and everybody comes in, you know, that takes those 
I have yeah. to remember to start playing guitar the week leading up to it so that my fingers are yeah, back it's like to get, functioning. Just getting in shape again. Yeah, not to yeah. mention that they just hurt after yeah. a full day of playing if you don't have your chops. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have your calluses. Yeah. I mean, people starting out, I mean, this is kind of a tangent, but people starting out playing guitar um, feel like they have to, they have to press the strings down so hard, but it's not really about how strong you are, how hard you're pressing down the strings, but it's what your what the end of your fingers are made out of. Because if they're made out of biscuit dough, then you can press down as hard as you can. The strings are still going to buzz. You know, uh, another thought, of, <laughs> thought about that too. You're absolutely right. And, and yeah. another thought about that is that um, playing guitar and having it not hurt and, and, you know, the question of how strong do you have to be, it is also a question of efficiency. You, yeah. I find that, when I'm playing it wrong, I waste way too much energy yeah. on stuff that doesn't need it. You know, like you're pushing, you're crunching your hand yeah. the wrong way. You're you're holding things the wrong direction, and um, and when I'm playing easily, it doesn't hurt as much. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? Or or when when your hand is conditioned to stretch in certain ways that it's just, you know, you don't have to think about it too much, and that just comes from time, just just repetition. Yeah. Um, but kind of getting back to like being who you are, that's the thing to cultivate because ultimately that's going to be the thing. You know, everybody has something that is unique and interesting and, and just their own story and perspective. And if you're authentic th to that and try to make that as good as it can be, then that's the thing people are going to hear and be like, I want to listen to this, you know. Because it doesn't sound like this other thing that's yeah. already been done. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's that idea of the the very best you have to offer is you done really well. Yeah, you done really well. That's great. Nice. There's my inspirational quote for the day. Yeah, <laughs> Lid Shaw. Are you sick of microphones that make your music sound harsh and brittle? The new Amethyst mic by Jay-Z Microphones brings you a rich, warm tone with perfect detail using the Golden Capsule technology. Resulting from 30 years of microphone design, the Amethyst is hand-built using carefully selected parts with Class A discrete circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and an advanced shock mount to make sure your recording sound awesome. This is my voice on the Amethyst right now. Use the limited-time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Amethyst Mike at jzmike.com. Okay, cool. Let's talk more about that morning, not looking at social media, writing. What are some things that you do find to be, um, I mean, you were beginning to talk about it, but just, just keep going on things that you do find to be a really positive way to start your day or a positive way to feel like your day is off to a really good start with, with being creative? Well, it helps if you can get some sleep. That's not always possible. Um, right, so but, if, you've, if you just yeah. feel kind of crappy and tired, it makes it that much harder to yeah, want to go right. Yeah, right? yeah. So, you know, you could start there. On the flip side, some of the, uh, sometimes I won't have a writing idea until... I've gotten ready to go to bed, you know, brush my teeth and uh, put on my sweatpants <laughs> if it's the winter time. Um, because at that at that point, your your mind is kind of free. Like after you've put to bed all the concerns and distractions of the day, then it's like your mind is this uh, it's kind of liberated, and then you might have an idea. And then you're like, well, I need to honor this. And if it means staying up till 2 or 3 a.m. and getting this song, so be it. But at that point, you know, the song has come late at night, and that's fine. Yeah. But if now, you can— Do you find, since so many of us might be watching a Netflix show late at night, you know, yeah. or something like that, do you find that to be an obstacle to any of that, or is that not, not relevant, like the— just do what you're going to do in the evening and, and maybe that song idea will come Yeah, to I don't know. For me, like I'm in a season of not watching hardly any TV at all. I think because I say yes to so much yeah. that I'm all, I always have a mix I need to be working on. Um, I always have some editing that could be done. And if I don't, then I have my own songs to mix. Yeah. Um, 
but one way one way or the other you know if you can if you can get up in the morning and just start your day in a in a positive way um with with no distractions and just go ahead and pick up your instrument or go ahead and open up that session or set up the microphone and start singing if you just start if you're a singer um you know, a lot of people that are listening to this are probably, just, they might not even be musicians, uh, but just, but open up a session and mix or start playing around with, with a plugins or, or do something creative that, that, um, that yields progress in what you're trying to do. You know, update your Pro Tools template or something. Just don't update you know, your, your OS X. <laughs> no, no, not if you're in the middle of uh, projects. <laughs> um, no, but you, you you used a word that I sort of caught my ear, which is just set up. Um, it's a reminder that there's always something that equals set up with whatever your creative process is, a little bit. And that's sort of the easier mm-hmm. thing to do. Like you yeah. can make your coffee and just start setting up a microphone because that helps you get to that point. It's like a transitional yeah. thing into the, the yeah. creative place. You know, yeah, the hardest is. thing is to, is to begin, you know, where uh, creating involves plugging in some microphones, opening up a session, and then like singing five bad takes before you get a good take. That doesn't sound as easy as like opening up Instagram and scrolling for an hour. <laughs> right, indeed. <laughs> but, but one of them, you know, there's a fork in the road. One of them is going gonna, is gonna to lead to good stuff and then the other is going to lead to like envy and just feeling inadequate. So like, where, where would you rather go today? Well, so I'm thinking about Fair Hazel again and maybe part of the thinking is like if you open up that Instagram at the end of making your thing, Give me something it. to share. Then, like, then, then you see some other stuff. Go check then you're it out. Using you know, the enjoy lightsaber. it. You know? Yeah. Um, and I know that for me, I'm I'm certainly uh, guilty of producing a lot of content, and mm-hmm. you know, with with things like YouTube and podcasts and yeah. um, social media. Although I, I don't do quite as much. I, I'm not. I'm no ninja uh, on Instagram in that respect. But um, I'm not either. You know, sometimes I actually feel guilty of not not being the, uh, the in the audience as much as I should be. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm always making something. Sure. Yeah. But I know I'm I'm with you on the the distractions of those and the places where I feel tripped up are in the creative process about like writing a song. So like becoming the voice that has something to say has always been a challenge for me with music. Like like lyrically or <laughs> yeah, I'd say or, I'd say yeah. like no one having something to sing about has always been yeah. a real challenge. I I'm challenged with that too. Like as a songwriter, I mean, part of what I do is co-writing, but like when I'm writing for myself, um, almost always, not all the time, but almost always, the music ideas come first, the melodies, the chords, the little guitar piano yeah, me ideas, too. and that's where the uh, the voice memos on the iPhone comes in handy um, because later when um, when something you want to sing about does pop into your mind, you know, you, ha- you can pick up a guitar and make something up from scratch or you can listen back through until, uh, and if, you're, if you have time to organize, sometimes you have a folder of your favorites, you know, like, okay, Sometime this year, I'm going to make something out of this. So let's let's geek on that for just yeah. a sec. So you you're talking about like having an iPhone, using the voice memo app that comes free in there, and capturing the guitar playing a chord progression yeah. or an idea. Yeah. And when you capture a thing, um, you know maybe that that first thing is nothing more than a sketch of a of a a chord change or something like that? Yeah. Or do you try and almost always at the beginning push yourself to to uh, play what might be a couple of verses in a bridge in an outro and lay, uh, it, lay it down on your iPhone like that? What I usually find myself doing is, um, like if it's guitar or piano, um, just like playing through the musical idea that I feel like 
is the reason I decided to record it. Um, you know, good something that caught my mind enough to where like I, I want to remember. I want to remember this uh, not just tomorrow, but in a year if it takes a year. Um, and I'll kind of play through that a couple times, and then I'll just leave it recording, and then I'll just kind of go to something, you know. And maybe that ends up being nothing. Maybe it ends up being the B section or the bridge or or some other part, but I'll just kind of see where it goes. And I'll usually, when I go back through and listen, I'll usually find that I have like three to five voice memos of the same idea. And, yeah, I've noticed that about myself. And there's too. like the early one, and then like the latest one is usually the one where like, okay, I spent half an hour, an hour with this, and and it's a little bit more fleshed out at this point. And there might even already be some lyrical ideas at that point. Well, so now let's talk about the folder idea. So yeah. um, in the voice memo app, does it actually let you make folders and collect all these different things into I different collections? I don't or do know. you sort of have a follow-up process? I don't know. It, it's, it's a follow-up process. Um, I When I import... I don't, is iTunes still a thing? I think it's going away. I think it's just got a new name or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like there's Apple Mute. There's streaming now, but I still have like an old version of iTunes on my computer and I can import all my voice memos via that. I think that might be an old way of doing it, but then I will just, I'll, I'll, I'll have that on my main computer drive and then I'll drag it to my backup drives as well. And um, just periodically, I'll listen through them. And when I love something, I'll just drag it over into a folder, say, saying like, you know, these are my favorites. So I think the takeaway there is it kind of doesn't matter whether it's iTunes or some other thing with a different name. It's that follow-up process of creating art. You know, you, you have the moment of inspiration and then the sketch capture. And then there's a, then there's a curating process that Mm -hmm. I think, so far, my my take is we all have to go through that. Like you have mm-hmm. to go through curating those initial sketches somehow. Yeah. Um, and which which means you know collecting the stuff, listening through, going like, "Ooh, that was a good one. Ooh, that was a good one. Ooh, that was a good one." Um, let's collect them and put them somewhere. What sort of environment is uh, the curating environment for you? Where what what works well for that, and and um, what what doesn't work for that? <laughs> It's just, well, I wish I had more hours in the day so I could curate more often. The, the earlier, the better, you know? Like, if you feel great about something, uh, hopefully hopefully you have the free time that week to kind of either do something with it or to curate it and put it in that folder. Um, but it's just my, my studio computer just in my control room at, at home, um, my studio room at home, just like maybe, maybe when I'm, um, maybe when I've had my fill of mixing or editing and I need a break. Right. You know. This is more of a, a consumer, um, action as yes. opposed to a creator action. Exactly. Because sometimes if, if I work all day and it's late at night, like I can't make great decisions at some point, you know, because my ears are tired. And so I want to be productive, but I don't want to like, uh, just like, um, sabotage myself by, by making poor listening, poor mixing decisions because my ears are shot or something. So at that time, you know, if I don't have like business stuff to take care of, maybe I'll uh, just listen through to some, to some voice memos or something and try to curate those or try so- to plan, make lists of like, songs or, or stuff that needs to be done on songs. Yeah, and this is just a, a place like a studio where you've got your computer in front of you. It's easy to manage the files and move them over and collect them and organize yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, just tidy up. I just have one computer. Yeah. 
Do you really want the neighbors banging on the ceiling when you're trying to rehearse or record your music? Do outside noises and computer fans get into your studio mic and ruin your recordings? You can book a pro studio to record every time, but that would add up quickly, and doing permanent construction to soundproof your studio could easily cost up to $100,000. And you can't take that with you when you eventually move the studio. Don't you wish there was an easy solution right now? Whisper Room ISO Booths offers a simple way to install a comfortable, quiet, ventilated ISO booth in your studio with easy line of sight for recording vocals or even drums in a variety of sizes. For 30 years, Whisper Room has been solving studio isolation needs with ISO booths that are shippable, portable, and can be assembled in an afternoon. Now you can get pro vocal recordings right in your home studio. Practice whenever you want and start using real guitar amps again. Get 10% off the 4x4 or 4x6 booth when you mention Recording Studio Rockstars at whisperroom.com. If you're using a Mac in your recording studio and you're tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly, then Otherworld Computing is the solution for you. OWC can help keep your existing Mac and studio current and relevant so that you can make great music. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac, you can get the most mileage out of your studio with OWC. Offering a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49, there's no need to get frustrated when you can achieve the speed to create and the capacity to dream at OWC.com. You know, I've done things in the past where I, I also have the tendency to just put my phone into record because I'll, when I'm idea sketching, yeah. I'll just go through so many ideas. I won't remember what I did, um, but I'll, I'll just record it. So I might record 20 minutes on my phone, 10 minutes of just playing guitar and then listen back later in the car mm -hmm. and hear things like, oh, that was cool, you know? Yeah. The problem with the car is you're like, oh, that was great. Oh, how do I make a note about it? How do I collect it without, you know, killing myself? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's so dangerous. Um, and, you know, going for a walk can be a great thing too, uh -huh. you know, being out in nature. Oh, yeah. Um, I think walking is fantastic for creative, uh, for having a creative mindset. So tell us more about your studio. What's your studio look like? So it's it's a, it's kind of a, what you might call a, a rec room or a bonus room in a house. Uh, my wife and I bought this house four years ago and like one of the big selling points, uh, our, our realtor knew that, you know, that I was a producer kind of wanting, wanting a studio space and the house we had before that she found for us had a, like a basement space. But this new house um, had this big, it's like 23 by 24 foot room in it with a vaulted ceiling. And so... So we bought that house and then I, I got some help um, building, a, building a wall that kind of creates a hallway. It's kind, of, it's kind of hard to describe without looking at we'll it. We'll call it a wallway. Yeah, a wallway <laughs> with, a, <laughs> with a loft on top. And what the hallway does is kind of buffers it off from the rest of the house. So I can be loud in there while my four-year-old's asleep and he won't hear anything. Um. So we've actually had house concerts in there at night and it, it's, it's, it's just a great space. I, I put a lot of uh, sound absorbers up, a little bit of diffusion. I made big bass traps with like rock wool, um, covered it all in this, in this nice looking canvas. And then there's closets behind the bass traps. And in one closet, I keep mic stands and, mics and things and the other closet actually I uh, access through the hallway and there's a little door and that's where my computer sits so I can record acoustic guitar at my desk and not have to worry about like a computer fan getting in the the mic or anything So like describe that. how that works so the the computer's hiding in the closet Yeah somehow? yeah and it's a ra it's a custom PC that fits in a rack space. It's not in a rack, actually. It's just sitting Interesting. on Interesting. So you're not doing Mac. You're doing I'm not doing PC. Mac. Um, I've always loved Mac, but 
when I got my own rig, going back to my cousin Monty, I, I used to work at his place and he had a custom PC. And at the time, I, I guess I felt like I could get more um, more power for less money. Kind of, kind of going that way because, um, I don't know. I, I get, I guess. Max just a little bit more expensive, and if you if you build your PC like well, the new Mac's a lot more expensive. Yeah, yeah, I haven't the, even looked at it. Sorry, the the new Mac Pro just came out recently, More like six and grand I, or something. Well, I actually I was looking at it and I saw the price, and I, yeah, and it was like six grand or something. And then yeah. I was like, oh wait a minute, but if I need to add on the hard drive and the nice and the higher processor mm-hmm. and the extra memory and you know whatever else it was, it, it I looked at the price and it was twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, that's that's new. All right, so go. Sorry, go ahead. So yeah. PC. So, so yeah, um, I had this guy. Uh, oh, what is it? Steve Lamb, who doesn't live in Nashville anymore, but he used to build custom rigs, custom computer rigs for people. And I just got, I just got him to build me one, um, and I put a little extra RAM in there, which it doesn't sound much, like a lot now, but I, I, I had this built in 2013 and I think it's got 16 gigs of RAM and it's uh it's great because it's very purposed you know it's not like a computer that's supposed to do anything else really right. I mean it I do get online with it and stuff like that but and so this is um what what apps are you running are you running pro tools with it are you using something else to record so into? I'm I'm pretty much only on pro tools now I I do own Reaper and Cubase, and I think a version of um, PreSonus Studio One. Um, but I haven't, I haven't really got into that one much. But, but you're using Pro Tools mostly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Pro Tools. Um, yeah. T- for people who are considering, they're like, "Well, I'm, a, I'm a Mac user, but I'm always curious about PC." But I've always heard that they're like, you get viruses and all this kind of stuff. Is That's that what been, I had always heard about them Yeah, was, too. and did you discover that that was an issue that, or were you like, ah, it's never it, been a it, problem? It, it's, it's not really an issue. There was one, uh, there was one episode several years ago where some malware got on my computer and I forgot what, I took some steps to remove it. And I've had that happen on a Mac too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at at the time, like it was very against the grain to go PC. Like I I had a Mac laptop and all that, um, but I was just I was just convinced, uh, you know, in this case that the custom PC was was the way to go, and and with this way, you know, I can replace individual components. Like, uh, upgrade, you know, I can. Right? Yeah, they're kind of easy to work on yourself. Like if like I've added drives. Right. On the inside of it, you know, I've added RAM. Um, I'm thinking about sometime next year, just kind of rehauling the whole thing. Yeah. You know, but well, so now, um, what about the interface? What do you like to use to record your audio? I use an it? Apollo Quad. Okay, great. Which is like the, not the new generation UAD Apollo, but the, you know, wh- whatever is new in 2014. Right. It has four preamps in it. Uh, eight audio inputs all together, and four of those are preamps. And then it also has like a ADAT optical, you know, you can get... Do you still use that feature? I do. I do. Is that even a current thing? Like, do people still use um, those? I, I, I have that on some of the gear, but I just don't use it that often. But yeah. The, um, but, but do you use that to connect an additional interface to yeah, your, your yeah. Polyquad? Yeah, um, My brother has a some kind of focus right eight channel thing and whenever i need 16 inputs which is not often but sometimes i do when i record a band in there um i'll just connect that cool um all right so you you keep the pc in the closet so that it's sort of sound isolated mm-hmm. and then you just run a cable through the wall or something like yep. that do you just like punch a hole through the wall and punch a hole through the wall I, you know i made it look pretty yeah yeah and that's that's a great solution for that. And then it just puts you and the screen and everything in there, but not the noise. Yeah. Um, and then your cables just did you did you actually install mic panel cables or anything? Nope. And, no, no, they're just going run a through cable a, under the closet door. Uh, kind of thing? The cables. So my control room is my tracking room. I should say that. Um, so I'm just running some cables, like not even a snake, but I have like a like a 
um, kind of a, a bundle of cables kind of, again, it's hard to describe without looking at it, but it's, it's running along the top of where the, the top of that wall that makes the loft. Right, and right. then it's coming down next to the piano and where the drums usually go. Well, that's one of those reminders um, yeah. too. I mean, you don't have to have like a custom snake. I, one of the things I did at Alex the Great, the first studio I was at, we needed mics to be mm-hmm. out in a certain area. And I found out that you can get um, what they call installation cable, which was like really thin mic cable from Megami. It yeah. was less expensive really and stuff, you could get yeah. long, long runs of it. Cool. Um, and if you're installing it like you did, you know, like up, up, up along mm-hmm. the corner of the ceiling and the wall, then it's never going to get bumped into. It doesn't have to be as tough yeah. as the other stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you, you know, you can run custom home runs to different instruments and just kind of leave a pair of female XLRs ready yeah. and waiting to plug into, which is which is pretty awesome. I should say one thing I did that kind of helps keep things straight. Um, I bought on Amazon.com <laughs> um, some mi- some different colored mic cables. Yeah. So so you know what's what. I know what's what. And they're in alphabetical order. So blue, starting with a B, is uh, is channel one. It's like blue, green, orange, and white or something. One, two, three, four. Those are my, my first You didn't four. want to learn the uh, resistor color codes? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> There's a... Uh, um, Oh, I can't even remember it. Uh, it's um, it's there's there's colors for the different values on a resistor oh. when you look on the electronics, and they represent different numbers. This is why I hesitate so. calling myself an engineer. And then sometimes, you know, sometimes the multi pair snakes of mic cables would also have multi pair colors inside it, and occasionally I would, you know, try and match that up to the resistor. Yeah, stuff. yeah. But it's just that idea of like just picking something that makes sense. Picking something that makes sense. Keeping yeah. it easy, mm-hmm. having a visual cue, smart. Yep. And then all my other mic cables, all just the standard black mic cables, um, I bought like a a rainbow array of colored um, electrical tape. And so I'll just kind of make stripes on those. So I know that, okay, this is the one with a brown and white stripe. So that's this one over here by the snare drum. That has a brown and white stripe on it too or whatever. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, smart. All right, well, cool. Well, let's take a break for a moment. We'll come back in for the jam session, the second half. And a reminder... We have links to Cheyenne's awesome music in a YouTube playlist, which is just in the blog post. Just click through and take yourself to the blog post and you can go check out the music that he's producing. And we're going to come back in a moment to talk more about songwriting and uh, some different cool production techniques for your home studio. Wonderful. You know what it feels like when inspiration hits and you want to capture your great song idea, but then the studio gets in the way and it's just no fun anymore. Wouldn't it feel awesome if you could simplify the process of producing new music from inspiration to final masterpiece? PreSona Studio One is a powerful digital audio workstation that helps you compose your music with a complete collection of virtual instruments for keyboards and drums, MIDI tools for hip hop, EDM, and film, a flexible sketch pad with chord charts and key recognition for songwriting and arranging, and classic effects pedals and amp simulators for guitar and bass. With 37 high-quality effects plugins, integrated Melodyne, and drag and drop flexibility, you can easily edit and polish your mixes. And Studio One is the only DAW with a built-in mastering studio so that you can take your record from writing to radio ready all in one place. Download your free version of Studio One Prime and get started now at PreSona wherever sound takes you. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you're going to need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics and Riga Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting colorations and distortions. 
questions. This is my voice right now on the new Amethyst microphone. With Class A discrete amplifier circuitry, extremely low self-noise, and advanced built-in shock mount technology to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the U.S., and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Amethyst microphone at jzmic.com. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the second half, the jam session. My guest today is Cheyenne Matters joining us here at the Toy Box, and uh, we're going to dig in and talk about writing some more tunes and um, some of these great records you're making. You ready to jam, dude? Cool, yeah, let's jam. So another project that you do is, uh, I believe it's called Bell Bear, which is um, you sort of composing with synths and stuff like that. Is yeah. that right? So tell us a little bit more about that transition, because I know you as this, you know, sensitive guitar, acoustic guitar and yeah. vocal, this lush sound that reminds me of Elliot Smith at yeah. times. Um, yet you're also doing this electronic side. So the quick version is, um, and we don't have to get off and talk about this, but I had a publishing deal for a little while and I found myself kind of producing things that maybe were trying to be more pop mm -hmm. um, and, and really just kind of getting into like programming beats and soft synths and stuff like that. M mostly just in the box kind of stuff. Um, and so, so when I had time to like do my own music again, um, I was like, well, I'm still sort of a folk singer, but I'm going to start using all these other tools that I've, I've kind of learned some chops on, you know? Um, and the fast forward to the, the bell bear thing, which I started about a year ago, um, it sort of came from, well, Bell Bear, um, my wife has this old uh, stuffed bear from the 70s. It's like a Fisher Price <laughs> bear. And it has these, these bells in it that have just this otherworldly kind of, kind of sound to it. Um, almost... It's like really cute, but really, but sort of creepy at the same time. Like, like not really dissonant, but some strange sort of cluster of notes these bells have. It's really neat. So that's where the name comes from. And and in some of the recordings, I kind of shake that bell. Um, kind of shake that bell. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was kind of browsing on Spotify and and discovered all these playlists with. I don't know, like what they call lo-fi till hip hop instrumental music, you know, and everything sounds like it's it's on an old vinyl record and they're using like vibraphones and, you know, real mellow kind of keyboard kind of stuff with these kind of, these beats that aren't almost like what you would think of like Jay Dilla or something, like not on the grid at all, yeah. you know, just like they have this kind of, uh, they don't, it's like the loops flop, don't line up or something. To yeah. yeah, really cool. Yeah, so that was what and, I wanted to ask you about that. I had trouble figuring out how to ask you or what it is. I know I hear it, Yeah. but for a moment I was like, well, what is that that I'm hearing? And it's almost like there's, a, it's almost like the drums kind of skip in different places. Yeah, yeah, they kind of skip. And I don't know how other people do it, but the way I do it is like, I'll, I'll, Kind of sometimes I'll play it on the MIDI controller. Sometimes I'll just like draw the beat on my MIDI screen. Um, with a grid and a tempo with, in there? With a grid, and then I'll just like move them off the grid. You know? Just see what they do. Yeah, just just like, just until it sounds like I want it to sound. Cool. Um, and then like I'll just try to get the warmest little like synth pad going. I might side chain it to something so... And, and layer um, static, pink noise, um, kind of throbbing, you know, with the beat in a way. Just try to get something cool going, and then and then I'll I'll write like a like some sort of melodic meandering thing over it, and just make and just make these pieces like a minute or two long. And my the reason I 
I mean, I, I love I love playing around with music that way, but I thought it could be a cool side hustle, you know, like if I landed one of these playlists, you know, it might be a, a little bit of passive income, you know. And mm. if I don't, it's just fun anyway. Yeah. So so back in February of this year, 2019, um, I just kind of started making these things. I probably made about 20 of them, but but I've only released um I don't know, like four. Nice. Four of them so far. So it's it's an idea for something that could be a little bit of a business move, but it hasn't gotten there yet. No, no, it hasn't. No, I, I haven't. I haven't really had time to like really, really pitch these or, or try to even know what to do with them. Um, but I'm just kind of making them, and I, and I have them. I have a bunch of them kind of lined up to release. So we'll see. What are some ways that getting a song out there, pitching a song? turning it into an income generator have worked for you in the past? And and what, what thoughts do you have about that process? Um, well, I've had, I've had one thing with the nobility that was on a commercial that, that was just, just a big amount of money, you know, strange how much money they pay for like a grocery store commercial. Right. Um, and, uh, and I, I've had a few smaller things that weren't much money at all, but um, but I think that if if you can kind of partner with somebody that that pitches to sync, um, then I, I think that could be great. I don't have anybody on my team right now that does that. Um, so, but you're focused as a songwriter, so obviously you're surviving. You know, you're able to manage, make ends meet, and, and yeah. raise a family and stuff. What are some other aspects about the the sort of the business side of what you do that do work and and places where you know uh, rock stars listening might might look to oh well this you know sometimes when you're starting out you're like I really want to make music but how do I how do I do this thing you know sure what what yeah. thoughts do you have or what advice do you have for people about that um well until like it's it's totally okay to have an outside job that's not music. And in fact, when I when I first moved to town, I would I was a valet um, for Lexus, so not like for a hotel or anything. But when people would get their cars worked on, I would uh, um, take their cars and go park them and kind of kind of bring them where they needed to go. And sometimes I would deliver the cars. Um, anyway, like going and fetching cars is a great thing to do if you want to have ideas, you know, because you're always walking, you're always running and musical ideas kind of come along, you know, with whatever rhythm (laughs) you're running to. Like if you're not working on, it's almost better to be like not working on music than to be working on music that you don't really like that's occupying that space in your brain that would be uh, thinking about music you do like. Mm. Now that said, when you're starting out, um, and even now, you know, you do end up working on things that might not be your favorite thing, but but you have you have to bring the same. Uh, you have to honor it, you know, just like it's something that really speaks to you. Um, and yeah, and you got to give and, it your best. Give it your best and 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 open open your mind to what it could be, you know. Because um, serve serve the artist or the client. So working a job um, is a good way to supplement the you know if you want to be a very strictly creative approach to music and and be a creator, be a writer. Yeah, um, and as it long gives as- you the if you if you find something that gives you the mental space to be thinking about a song in your head and then, you know, pull your phone out and sing the idea into it. Um, Something about cars too and driving. Yeah. You you can listen to a little music. Yeah, driving like, you know, being an Uber. I've never done that, but but I can imagine, you know, those kind of jobs could, uh, you could have a lot of time just to think and, and create, you know, even if you're not listening to music, just like driving in silence, you know, you have, you have ideas there's a lot of um, musicians in Nashville that are driving Uber, 
you know, to film yeah. the time. One of the really cool things about it is any of these jobs that, that sort of like interface with your phone and the internet now that allow you to just simply work when you want to work. Mm-hmm. You say like, I'm going to just go work for a few hours now um, as opposed yep. to I'm going to write or create. It's pretty cool, you know, I yep. think. Um, well, that's groovy. So there was a, you, you've also been producing and doing this electronic thing. Was You talked about some of the pop. Some of the records in your playlist are sort of more pop production. And I wanted to ask you, like, what do you, What's different about doing the pop productions than the folk song writing and production? Um, you know, how is that process a little different? Well, there's a lot of similarities probably, and there's a lot of bleed and overlap between the two, I think. But maybe maybe one of the one of the big differences is just like MIDI, you know, using starting a track. Using You're also staring at a computer screen. Samples. Anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm still I'm I'm a guitar player, so a lot of what I do still starts out with a voice memo and a guitar. But then some things start out with a beat, you know, and um, and then just like playing a synth into that or or something, you know. It mm-hmm. it all it all kind of kind of blends together. I guess. Yeah, so, but, so you're sort of uh, programming and doing it that way. And then when you're working with a band or an artist, um, you know, you, I know there were some things like, um, I think it was FM Lonely Eyes. Yeah. It's got this great kind of splatty drum production on it. Was that, oh, are those thank real you. drums or are those? No, uh, that, that particular stuff? song, I'm pretty sure is a programmed drum thing. For some of the FM stuff, it's it's real drums. And then... For some of it, like we didn't have a budget to to do a live band for everything. So like, you know, after that budget was spent, it's like, all right, well, I'm just going to make the rest of this right here in my room. And I'm not a drummer. Um, so yeah, I probably used Native Instruments Battery 4. Um, and yeah, I have, Battery was one of the first ones I had. Yeah, yeah. And I have some of my own samples I've made. And then I have a lot of great libraries that I've picked up. And it's, I don't remember the specific sounds I used for that, but sure. yeah, I just I just wanted something punchy and splatty is a good word for yeah, it. Yeah, then the snare is like. Pfft, I love yeah. that splatty snare sound. Yeah, it can be tricky to get with real drums, um, but what what are some oh, fun well, ways to record real drums that you want to talk about? Well, well, like with real drums, if you're going for something that you find that you can't really achieve with microphones, there's always trigger. Right. And you ever use that? Yep. You know, like sometimes like layering in a little bit of, a little bit of kick under the kick and a little bit of snare under the snare gives it just that extra punch. Um, but for some types of music, you know, it's best for it all just to be just real and organic. Mm-hmm. Um and something I might have sort of picked this up from you and Robin, but recording drums with less than eleven mics, <laughs> yeah. like minimal mics, you know, like starting out. Um, I was assistant engineer on some country demo sessions, and they would set up like a bunch of mics, you know. So when I started kind of producing my own stuff in the studio, I would just kind of do that. But I didn't. I hadn't really learned much about phase yet. Right. I just kind of hope for the best, mm-hmm. you know, and then just beat my head against the wall trying to EQ it to sound good. Um, but sometimes you don't need a lot of mics, you know. Sometimes you just need two or three. Yeah, if you've got two mics on a drum kit, where, where might you put them? So almost always like a little bit in front of the kick because I feel like um, that, whatever low frequencies are important there or need some room to develop maybe. And then like, I usually don't point if I'm, if I'm not using a lot of spot mics, then I usually don't point much at the cymbals at all because they're always just going to be loud. Um, so I try to get like a good kick and a good snare, um, you know, so kind of out in front of the kick and then maybe, maybe something on top is kind of pointing down at the drummer's knees. So you're kind of getting the snare and all the toms. Yeah, that's an interesting way to think like about that. it. Like when you're thinking about miking up the drum kit with minimal 
just remembering like what are the mic what are the instruments that I actually really want to hear in this sound and yeah. stuff. Well, I probably still want kick and snare yeah. to be pretty cool. So just start with putting yeah. the mic where the kick and snare sound cool and see what everything else sounds like. Sure. Then. Yeah. And uh and not being a drummer myself, you know, I've done a whole lot of drumming for not being a drummer, but what it is is I might you know, bring over a floor tom and just layer something and bring over snare and layer it and just have like a small diaphragm condenser pointed at it, you know, where it sounds good. You know, one of the things um, reminds me of a record I did a long time ago with Mickey Grimm where um, we needed to do a bass and a snare part together and he played them individually instead of on on a drum kit. Bass, drum, and snare drum? Yeah, he hit the the bass, drum, and then played the snare part and uh, obviously, it's easier to record because then you're like, oh, I'm just putting one mic on, trying to yeah. get one cool sound for one instrument. Yeah. But but I was struck by just how rubber bandy it makes a groove feel yeah, if you break up the drums like that. Yeah, that's a great record reference for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my brother Will and I did that a few years ago with a floor tom and a the floor tom was kind of acting as a kick and a snare drum. And we used those little Josephson C42 do you, do you know that? It's, I know the it's Justin like a, mics, yeah. I think it's yeah. the E22 is the Tom mic or something, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Well, these were small diaphragm condenser mics, little yeah, tiny things they're great. that they just sounded so good, so dry and, and immediate, you know, like it's right in front of your nose, which is what we wanted on that particular recording. Well, it's one of those things that can be hard to come to terms with with drums is like sometimes you want a certain sound and you're struggling to get it out of a whole drum kit with a drummer playing and it's like, there's no rule well, that says you have to play the drums on a full drum kit with a drummer actually playing it. You know, it can be like individual absolutely. sounds that you're just layering yeah. together and making it work. During the height of record making, Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stax Studios, Ardent Studios, and the New York City Record Plant all turned to one company to build their consoles. That company is now Spectra 1964, carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. The extremely stable, high-speed circuit design of the 101 amplifier provides unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you cleaner, punchier, dynamic recordings. Spectra 1964, brings you the sound of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and so many more. Created by the missile engineers who were central in rolling out the systems that protected the free world for over half a century, Spectra 1964 literally brings rocket science to your studio. With the STX 600 mic pre with built-in comp limiter, full frequency passive BBDI, and C610 dedicated comp limiter, start making records that last a life time at spectra1964.com. But let's back up and, and say, like, when, when I was first starting out, um, I kind of wrongly assumed, well, you, you can do a lot to, you can do a lot to process the sound. So uh, it's not necessarily wrong, but it's just, it's not efficient, like, to assume that it doesn't really matter what it sounds like. You know, you can just EQ it and make it sound like whatever you want to. Um, tune the drum, you know, pick drums that you love the sound of. Right, that sound like the sound you're trying to get. Yeah, like like the instrument itself, like two acoustic guitars sound very different, you know, and start there. Start with a, in the room, of course, too. Um, you know, there's, the the room plays a huge part in in uh, in what something sounds like, but but before the room, the instrument itself um, is is everything. You know, like like if if you have a drum set that just sounds like crap, um, you know, e- either tune it or or pick some new drums. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm with you on yeah. that. It's it's very easy to let that stuff. Slip past you at it's first. Easy. Yeah, don't be then, lazy on the front end. And then you're wondering why it is that you're having mm-hmm. so much trouble making this work in the end. And because you're going to spend hours and hours, and then you're just going to like sample replace it, right? Or give or up? Or redo it? Or, or, or give redo up. it? Yeah, that's a hard thing to learn how to do too. Is to just erase something and start over. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes some, that's the answer. Sometimes that's the only yeah. most effective way to do it. Um, Waves of Onyx again. That's one of your. Bizarre synth productions. Yeah. 
Um, and again, that sounds kind of like drum machine and synth production. Mm-hmm. You also had these great um, little videos that go with them with lots of crystals in them and stuff like that. What's, what's oh, the process so, for making videos to so go with your music? I'm post? making, so, so there's my record coming up is called Sapphired Up and there's a song called Sapphired Up, um, which it, I mean, I guess it's sort of a play on so fired up, um, but I'm making a video of that with and I'm just this amazing uh, video guy named Luke Harvey. And we, uh, we're filming a lot of crystals and gemstones and trying to make like a, like an extraterrestrial landscape out of those. And so we use some of that just to make little uh, looping videos just for YouTube content for some of the other songs. So that's, that's what you see on that. Um, what's tricky about, uh, now is, so, so do you have a video producer like Luke to kind of lean on where like, here's the mix. And then he gives you back a video or you, have you learned a couple of things about putting music to the video and then posting it online and things like that? Is there I, anything tricky about it? Um, I haven't done a lot of my own video stuff. All right. And I, I will, I do have a couple of apps. Like I made a little teaser for echolocation, um, with there, there's some apps that can like just put kind of cool filters on your video that yeah. look like an old VHS or something. Yeah, those yeah. are kind of fun. I think to play iMovie around. on a Mac will even do that stuff too. iMovie has, has stuff some good PC. stuff, but there's I'm trying to remember the the name. Well, so now you away, finish but, a song um, and you produce something. If it's your own, um, what's the follow up process? Uh, how do you make sure that you've You've sort of uh, done this right that it's cataloged properly. That if that if it gets a chance to earn money, that you're they'll know who to pay, kind of thing. Oh yeah, well definitely um, register it with your PRO. Okay, so what does be, that mean, really quickly? So performance rights organization. First of all, join a PRO, uh, CSAC, ASCAP, or BMI if you're in the USA, and. Join as a publisher and as a writer because there's two streams of income. Um, of course, that's that's just the composition income. And then you have your master rights income, which is, there's two different copyrights with a song. There's the composition, uh, meaning like if you write a song, if somebody else covers it, you still own the composition Am I saying that right? Yeah, the composition so. yeah. rights? Sure. Um, but then they would own the master recording, which is specific only to that version that they recorded, the actual sound recording of it. And you would own your own version or your record label if they're paying for it, just depending on what your contract says. Um, so you do the PRO, you pick one. And yeah. then What's the what is that like to um, register the song with a PRO? You you like every one just, minute clip that you do gets registered. I'm with or? I'm with CSAC. How's that work? And I just kind of log in and just you know follow the you, you know register a new song. Just a web kinda, form kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's just a web form. Um, does it actually uh, is it is it a thing where you have to like oh is it worth paying twenty five bucks every time I register a song or is that not the way it works? You don't have to pay to register a song with, or, or or maybe you're talking about the copy, the government copyright. I'm just at, I'm at yeah. trying to ask the dumb question. So for for sure. anybody, any of us who are like I've never done that before, just trying to understand yeah. those. Yeah, kind of yeah. Things. Well, certainly at the early stages of being a creator, being young, not having done something yeah. before, the thought of paying 10, 20, 30 bucks to do anything <laughs> will stop you in your tracks. Sometimes, I know. You know. Well, for. Well, there's a good, um, you know, there's a lot of options for distribution. Mm -hmm. Um, A few years ago, I kind of landed on DistroKid. Um, I've heard great things about that. Yeah, because they, you just pay like 20 bucks a year and you can release unlimited music. You could release a hundred singles if you did them. Now, what does it mean to, when you say release and, and you can do that, somebody else might mm. listen, might go, but I just uploaded it to Instagram. I uploaded it to YouTube. Didn't I just release it? Um, well, Why is that yeah. different? Well, sure. I mean, sure. I mean, that that 
counts as releasing. You're letting people hear it. But I guess I'm talking about like getting it on platforms like Spotify, or sure. iTunes, Apple Music, Amazon. Um, I so, mean, in the future, Spotify might become, you know, where, where you can just upload yourself. But I think you still have to go through a distributor now. That's all right. So you use, a, you use a service like DistroKid, DistroKid. and it's Kid. now in all the places all at once, similar to the way... Yeah, you could pick your date as long as it's like two weeks in the future. Okay. I use a, a service for the podcast called Libsyn, and when yeah. I upload it there, then it automatically puts it on mm -hmm. YouTube and iTunes and all these other places. Yep. But also DistroKid um, helps um, collect any possible streaming income and things like that, or not? Yes. Yeah, they, um, yeah the streaming in income all goes to them. If you've co-written a song, the cool thing is if you cover a song or you've co-written a song, like the composition royalties, Spotify just sends it straight to the other people. Like you don't have to worry about about that or like like writing people a check from what you get. And which one takes care of that, the, the co-writing aspect? Um, DistroKid does? Well, I, th I think that's a Spotify thing. Okay. I think, and, and I was kind of confused about that for a while because some of the songs that I released, I wrote uh, back when I had a publishing deal. So I was kind of worried about like, am I doing this right? Do I need some kind of license, you know? Um, but then I discovered, no, no, you you really don't because because CSAC, like they're going to pay the PROs um, based on your based on your performance. Right, okay. I think. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, well, let's talk about co-writing for a minute. What does it mean mm -hmm. to co-write? How do you know that you've co-written a song? How do you know that, uh, how, do, how do you make sure that other people know that you co-wrote that song? And wh where are the places where you can get accidentally um, not credited for having co-written something? Yeah. Um, I, don't th I don't think I've ever had, you know, been not credited. Um, I, and the, the Nashville community is very much a co-writing community. Uh, it's just kind of a normal thing. You know, most people in Nashville <laughs> wake up and say, well, maybe I'll go write a song today. Um, Do you ever find but, yourself in situations where um, you didn't say, hey, let's co-write something, but you feel like you did co-write it? You mean like if I'm collaborating with somebody and then they use the idea? Yeah, maybe you're, maybe you find yourself in a recording production capacity. Ah, uh, like maybe, and I, then you get really involved in like the songwriting, a, like an too. old Funk Brothers kind of. Did you ever watch that documentary about the Funk Brothers? I think so. Yeah, it's been, it's been the a guy came up with a guitar lick for "My Girl," which is like the signature of the song. Yeah, and he wasn't necessarily credited as a writer until so maybe now he is. I think I think they corrected that. Um. I don't know. Since I produce things for people and play on records, I guess sometimes that comes up. That comes up maybe. Like if somebody else wrote a song, but then I never want to feel like I'm just kind of wedging my way in there. Oh, I'm a co-writer now because I did this. And, right. Um, so I feel like a lot of times there may be like, or work for a higher form. They're supposed to be. There's usually not um, that the musician signs saying, okay, this is a work for hire. You're playing on this, but you didn't write it, you know, even if you come up with something um, that kind of sticks. Um, so, I mean, when I'm playing on a session and somebody else wrote the song, I, I'm never like, hey, I'm a co-writer now. Um, I think it's just sort of understood that you're kind of hired to do a certain thing and, you know, you may invent something in the process, but you wouldn't have invented it if somebody hadn't said, here's this song, do something cool right. on it. So so co-writing is more an intentional thing where like, I think we're it, getting together yeah, to write together. I think it's more intentional and it, it happens a few different ways. You know, you can like get together with the purpose of co-writing a song and uh, you might have like, the way I do it usually um, cause I'm really quick with like, um, music ideas and a little slower with lyrics is. But you got some great lyrics, dude. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, 
I'll just kind of start playing. Like we'll be talking, like me and my co-writers. A lot of times it's three people or four. Really and writing all at once. Writing all at once, yeah. Wow, and, and you find that is... When um, I'm writing with bands. That can, oh, okay, with a band, you know, okay. Or, or, or with a But not like a four duo. people with acoustic guitars sitting in a circle necessarily? Yeah, usually a lot of times I'll be the one with a guitar, you know? Um, sometimes more than one person has a guitar. But I'll just kind of g- let the conversation... Whatever, because people will just be sitting around talking about ideas. What do we want to write that day? You know, what are we feeling today? What What's on our mind? What's on our heart today? And I'll I'll kind of provide a soundtrack to that, like an improvised soundtrack, like background music to that. And then I'll change it up from time to time. And then at some point, somebody will say, ooh, I like that. And then somebody might kind of sing a melody over it or something. So it kind of comes... From that, a lot of and I the, love keep writing the that uh, way. memo app rolling the whole time or anything like that. Yeah, just right and, an idea. and I'm fortunate enough to uh, a lot of times have a co writer who's really obsessive about that, and they'll be rolling the whole time, so I don't have to worry about like, yeah, you know, using my hard drive space. But in the studio, sometimes I will go ahead and open up Pro Tools and just kind of have an Omni mic on and just kind of roll it so that way, um. You know, you can come back to, if somebody's like, that thing we were doing 30 minutes ago, that, that was great. Let's listen to it again. Um, you can always kind of go back to that and, yeah. and listen. Now, um, what about, uh, are there sometimes where you start a song with somebody and you co-write something and then they take it and they finish it out with somebody elsewhere mm-hmm. later? How does that work? Well, usually, yeah, they just become a, a third writer or something like that? Yeah, they become a third writer. And, I, and I'm usually like, you know, if they're contributing to the process, then I'm always happy to get a third writer on something. You know, I'm, I'm not stingy with like, no, it needs to be, I need 50% of this, not 33. Um, now, if I might, I might have an opinion on it if I feel like it's just done and it's great and then, you know, somebody wants to come in and kind of change it. But if it's if it's going to mean the difference in this gets released or this doesn't get released, then I'm usually like, okay, come on, you know, add your, sometimes it's a track person, you know, sometimes I'll write a song and then somebody who's like a track guy or girl um, will kind of put that thing on it, which might come from the pop world, I guess. What does it mean, a track guy or a girl? Um, How would you describe that? Well, I guess like some people just make music, like musical things with no vocals. Uh, what people call tracks, you know, like a like an interesting, uh, catchy song for somebody to sing over. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what they do, and I've done a bit of that as well, because um, like big pop stars, a lot of times will uh, like choose they'll choose a track that they want to go on their next album, and then they'll send it to like a hundred top liners, and just kind of have their pick on you know what comes out of that. The best. So basically, it's yeah. like constructing a song and then when it's ready then the pop artist will go sing it in the studio sure yeah Yeah, it's a fascinating well, process if you see and I haven't done a whole lot of like real pop world stuff like that um, I've done mostly like indie stuff but like if you look in if you look at the amount of writers on some of these big hits sometimes it's like 15 people wow yeah it's, you know? it's more like making a film making a movie or yeah. something like that yeah yeah you know, whatever works, whatever yeah. gets Well, the there. cool thing about that idea, too, is just what you said early on. Like, it's easier for you to do the, the chords and the music and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And the thought that you you don't have to be stopped in your tracks if, if you're stuck at the lyric, you could actually just make a bunch of music and then just start sharing it around with people. Oh, yeah. If like, if, if, thing, you're, yeah. if you're stuck making music, like well, I'm not good with lyrics. That shouldn't stop you from making music. I mean, some of the biggest hits in the world are just instrumental songs. 
Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer and a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins in PreSona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. Another thing that you do some of is just strictly mixing. Yeah. Um, you had, I'd met you over at Monty Powell's studio. Mm -hmm. You were mixing on his system there. Yeah, spoiled. Um, yeah, there was, uh, let's see, there was one of the... Carl Tatt. Uh, John, James Paul Mitchell, Anxious Angel, is a great sound. It sounds like Elliot Smith, and I think that was one of the tracks that you mixed in our YouTube playlist. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your mixing process. I think you also yeah. mentioned templates, but uh, I, want, I want to, uh, let's start by asking you what you remember learning mixing at Monty's and using this like really high-end speaker system. Um, some of the challenges for you about like learning how to mix. Well, uh, back that was a long time ago, and I feel well. I hope I know more now than I did then. But I, <laughs> um, interestingly, I learned that if it sounds good in that room, that can be deceptive because that is such a good room, like. Like sometimes I would do mixes in there and I thought they sounded good. And then I would get them in the car and like, whoa, the, what's up with this bass? You know, and maybe that was, says more about the car than the mix. But still, I, I didn't reference back then. I, I've just kind of in the past few years learned that it's, it's really helpful to um, listen to a lot of music in whatever room you're working in. So you kind of have an idea of what some of your favorite mixes sound like. Um, and then also as you're mixing, when you get close, like I, w I wouldn't start out by referencing, you know, if I'm just starting a mix, um, I might kind of listen to some music, but I wouldn't really try to, um, try to reference right off the bat. But after you get it sounding good, like maybe reference a track um, or a couple of tracks you like, just for like balances. Like, cause that's going to tell you, wait a minute, this snare drum, for me, it's really easy to make the drums too loud. Yeah, I can because, do that too sometimes, you know. Because the drum, like if the drums are really loud and you're kind of grooving to them, then all the other instruments become a lot less important, you know? So things, you might have sort of a cluttered mix, but the drums are just punching through so it doesn't seem cluttered. But then when you compare it to other things, it's like, well, I just mainly hear the drums. And not the <laughs> so, um, actually, I think from your podcast, I got the idea to to buy that. I think it's just called Reference that plugin. Yeah, where you can like load in a song, mastering the. So mix. you don't have to like bounce back and forth between Spotify and your DAW. You know, you can just kind of bring it up in there. Yeah, the the plugins that particular one I love. Um, it it lets you just click over to your reference mix or click over and hear the mix you're working on. Plus, yeah. it level matches the two for you, so that yeah, you don't level have to matches be, them, and then it shows you, you have to do that yourself. Um, I've only owned this plugin for just a few weeks, by the way. Um, so I don't even know if I'm unlocking its full potential, but it shows you like a little line or something, like if 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 that, it has three bands, right? Yeah. So if like your mids are like way higher than the reference tracks mids, it's going to like actually show you. And yeah, I, I'm intrigued by that. I still actually have trouble wrapping my brain around it. Something about the visual on that one that, that confuses well, me a bit. I think it's like, you don't want to mix with your eyes. You know, your eyes are, uh, can get you into trouble. But but they can also be an aid just to show you, like if something just doesn't sound right, like one of my favorite tools is an analyzer, you know, specifically the FabFilter EQ that 
it has just the really powerful surgical EQ and mm-hmm. an analyzer because if something's poking out, you don't have to like f- spend forever finding it. You can just look at it and see it, of course, but your ears have to be king, you yeah. know. Your hear- ears have to hear it too. Your ears have to hear it too. Um, and always just A, B something like bypass it and then, and then you know, uh, listen to it in and just make sure you like the difference. Um, one of the really fun things for me recently has been getting a newer car that mm-hmm. has, um, and then I've subscribed to Apple Music. And so now, like if my phone's plugged in in the car, I just press the button and I tell Siri to, you know, hey, yeah. play me a song by so-and-so. And that's great. It's been fun because it allows me to drive around and think of a, a genre and like compare really quickly. Sure. And just like play little yeah. snippets of songs. And I mean, I'm not finishing songs. I'm just literally listening for like, how do these all sound next to each other? And yeah. It's, it's really a lot of fun to be well, able to well, do that. One, one thing that has really, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've come close to just pulling my hair out about mixing over the years, you know, almost almost come to tears a few times, you know, I mean, like, why? I've tried so hard. Why is this not sounding good? Um, but but one thing that um, is uh, um, helpful to know if if you really study some mixes that is that hit songs, Sound drastically different from one another. I right. mean, I mean, you can. It doesn't have to be one thing. Now, maybe like within a genre, like within a year, like maybe a few songs. There are trends and whatever. That's one reason I love making indie music because it it can be a little bit outside. Um, but there's always some room to play, you know, like in in the way things are balanced, you know. So. I think it's most important to go with your heart, how how music makes you feel. Um, and, um, you know, rather than kind of worry about all the technical details. Yeah. Um, and then you go back, like if you follow it that far and you trust your feeling about it in the moment, and then you go, compa- you know, hold it up in the light to some other stuff, I find sometimes you can tell pretty quickly it's like oh all my stuff's a whole lot quieter than these other productions or yeah you know i have i have my bass is too out of control compared to this other stuff totally and then i might yeah. go back and, and still, address just those things if i can and see how far yeah I can exactly get them. Yeah. It, i feel like it, it it's a process it's like it's uh things encourage you you know hold on to the things that encourage you um, and the things that discourage you, um, you know, use use those as kind of as kind of creative points. Like, how can you flip a failure into into a success? Yeah, yeah. You know? And then the number of times that I might go back in and make an adjustment to a mix to try and solve that thing, and then listen back in the car later and be like, you know what, I like that first mix better. That's just the one. That's the um, one for this record. Well, I think. The story of is it Billy Jean, where they mixed it like ninety two times and then wow. went back to mix two. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's great. I'm I'm glad I didn't have to hear ninety two mixes of that. <laughs> yeah. Um. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit more about yeah. So so talk about your mix setup now. So you're mixing in okay. your PC. Um. You yeah. mentioned the word templates. What are some things around templates that you find really useful? How does that process work for you? And how do you want to encourage people to um, to start integrating the idea of template into their mix? Yeah, so templates, uh, and I'm, I should say I'm using a older, I'm using Pro Tools 12. Um, and I think Pro Tools, um, the newer one, might have some new features where you can import stuff more easy, easier. But um, yeah, I just have like, I have my uh, effects, and I have I have several buses that I use normally. Um, so I have like a bus for drums. I have several instrument buses, um, and a, a few vocal group buses, and then an effects bus. So so everything can can be categorized into those things. 
Um, and then I have just my favorite effects just ready to kind of kind of pull up um, already in the template. Like if I'm creating or if I'm mixing, I can just kind of import session uh, import session data. What's the purpose of having a different bus for the drums versus a, a bus for different instruments? Um, well, the drums are like they're sort of like one instrument, you know, but they involve a lot of tracks. So it just you can kind of glue everything together. Um, it, it's nice to be able to treat them as a group, you know, instead of like, well, obviously, you know, you could put compressors on every little track or you could just uh, just put some nice compressor, uh, compression, EQ kind of on the whole group, uh, the whole drum bus or instrument bus or, or whatever. And you can also, uh, if you need to, like mute all the guitars for whatever reason, you know, for listening purposes or mute all the vocals and just listen to the track. You can do that easily. Yeah, um, just by without, muting like, the bus. Click, 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 click. Yeah. You know, you can just yeah. do a few clicks. Yeah, those are great reasons. Um, all right, so, so you've got your buses, you've got some effects um, that you like. Where do they, How are they stored or where do they live? And uh, it kind of doesn't matter I, to me, the old version versus the new version. It's, yeah. it's like... There's a process to yeah. just organizing your yeah. your creative flow. Um, so, so, like, what's a smart way to yeah. just simply store that so that when you come to do a new mix, you're like, I know where to find well, my I'll, buses and my effects. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll save my template as a template, but I'll also save it as a session. So, um, so I can, uh, I think it's called import session data, um, and kind of drag in any track that I want and anything about that track that I want. You know, if I want all the inserts, um, all the all the routing, all the sends, you know, I can drag that into whatever new session I make. So if somebody, a lot of things I mix are things I produce, so they're already kind of on my template, but then a lot of things I mix, people will just send me, you know, and it's either a Pro Tools file or it's a um, just a folder of WAV files. So I can just kind of import all that. So then you would, um, when you finish a project, do you try and always give yourself an extra moment to just, you know, um, squirrel that template away into a special folder that's just called like mixed templates? So you always have it Usually, later. Usually not when I finish a project. I'm usually just kind of thinking about where I want to start. And from time to time, we'll just update my main template. It's usually, usually how I go. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Um, any other thoughts about, you know, the process of mixing and, and keeping it efficient? Do you try and keep that template, you know, the the organizing stuff separate from the the mixing creative flow? Um, or do you just sort of sit down and knock it all out and I just kind of sit down steady out. flow? I think I just kind of just try to get flowing at first. And well, I, I'll say this. I don't know if this is um this might be a little bit of a tangent, but um, a lot of people, a lot of people who are dedicated mix engineers and sort of that's the main thing they do. Uh, they prefer things to be to be edited for obvious reasons, um, but some of my mixing process is actually editing because I find that. When I fix little things, it makes the mix easier. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. What kind of little things come pop pop into your mind when you're thinking about this idea? Um. Well, things lining up, you know. So timing, sometimes tuning, sometimes vocal tuning, um, and then sometimes like removing noises and and Stuff things that's like that. Junking up the the sound, mm -hmm. the, the space, and then also committing you know in pro tools there's a feature called commit like let's say you have if you're trying to mix and you have 100 tracks and 20 of those tracks are background vocals and 20 of those tracks are strings um you might just you can simplify all that in like routing all those to their own bus and then and then if you if you're using plugins or whatever on the bus to get it to sound great uh, you can commit those all just to a stereo file. Now, it's do you just select the bus augs return track and then just sit, click commit on that and it 
it creates an audio file. I forgot how that works. Yes. So yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. So you time. so you select your your region, um, and you can also do this thing called freeze, which is kind of a temporary commit. But I like just to do commit because it creates a wave file, and you can tell it to like make your other files inactive or, um or just hide them and make them inactive so they're out of the way. You don't have to think about them anymore. Yeah. And if in the event that you're like, well, I actually do kind of want to change this, you can always just go back and just activate the other tracks and fix them and then commit it again. But I like to see, oh, I got this from, what's his name? Tom Elmhurst, fantastic mix engineer. Um, he was saying that he has an assistant to do all this for him, but uh, if you can get everything, if you can shrink everything down to where all your tracks, all your buses and effects will fit into one edit window where you don't have to scroll, then that's a good indicator that 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 this is not too much to wrangle. You know, you can, you know what I'm talking about? Like, like, like you have to think about less. Right. Like if, so you don't have to go up and down in your session to find the different instruments and tracks. Yeah, and it's not all about just going up and down, but it's just like having the, not having just so many things to keep track of. You know, it's like groups of things. If you love the way they sound, you know, just, just commit them and treat that like a track, you know, even yeah. if it's like a group of instruments. Yeah. You know? Well, back in the day with the when my computer was less powerful, I used to have to like export the session as a bounced mix. Then we'd go like cut strings in a new session, mm -hmm. then bounce those, and then yeah. import them back into the other session. I still sure. have to do that sometimes. I mean, oh, if you yeah. got a if you got a mix that's yeah. really like taxing your computer, and yeah. somebody wants twelve more vocal tracks stacked up, yeah. Well, I mean, to me, like taxing your computer is one reason, but also just taxing your mind is is the other. You know, if you uh, if the drums are sounding great and you don't have to worry about them anymore, then you can um, you can just kind of move on and focus on on other things, you know. And you might have to go. I, I rarely commit the drums, but um, I mean, I will eventually when I make stems. But um, I find it nice to be able just to kind of work on the big picture like after after all the details are kind of are kind of working well yeah um all right well so let me jump over i got a, i got a couple more questions yeah. before we close out here uh this one i want to talk about songwriting again mm -hmm. with you one of the tunes that we did over here for the stereo sessions um which was the live video performances here in the studio and uh, rock stars have included a couple of those clips are in in Cheyenne's YouTube playlist. So if you want to see what we used to do here, um, you might want to do it in your studio too. It was a lot of fun. Oh yeah, just doing live performance videos. Uh, but Star Counting and Gold Rush, um, both great songs, great lyrics, um, and I really had a chance to re-listen on this time around. Um, and it just made me think about your mastery of lyric and word and metaphor and saying things that sound like sort of classic word clusters from classic songs. Um, how, how do you, or how, either how do you arrive at words that you feel good about in songs or um, what, mm. what tips do you have for the rock stars about, you know, finding words that they don't feel like, oh, this is stupid. This isn't me. This isn't my voice, but it's got that cool coolness to it. Um, and along with that, when you're working with other songwriters and artists and you find that there's a tendency towards cliche, mm -hmm. how do you encourage them away from cliche into something original that, that um, sort of has that same gravity? I mean, we like cliches yeah. because they have this catchiness to them, they, but they, they're never, they're never they our meaning, words. Yeah. Um, I don't know about what my exact process is um, for that, other than than having uh, than having just a moment to myself. Um, sometimes it's late at night. Sometimes I'll be on a trip, 
you know, and just have some downtime while I'm on tour or something like that. And it just feels like entering a world. Like with my music, I know it's it's not trying to be a certain genre. It's it's always evolving. It's uh, um, it's it's just indie music, you know. Um, and I feel like one one thing I'm trying to get better at from an early age, I was I was okay with lyrics that sort of made sense to me um, in, in some strange way that might not make sense to anybody else. And, and right. now, especially since co-writing with people and all that, um, I try to make, I try to challenge myself to really write things that are going to mean something to somebody else. I, I think a lot of the lyricists I grew up listening to and, and really liking, some, um, some of it's very abstract, you know, like maybe Jeff Tweedy, uh, and then some of it's very concrete, like um, Lucinda Williams, for instance, you know, I mean, she sings a song and you know exactly what she's talking about and she's just a master, you know exactly what she's feeling. Um, and and I, I relate to both. So I feel like um, for me, uh, I think a lot of lyricists will say this too, like um, the sound, kind of how, how the word rolls out of your mouth is part of the music itself. You know, the music is as important as the lyrics. To some people, lyrics aren't that important, you know, as long as it sounds good, it's, it's cool, you know? And, and I get that because the music itself is conveying uh, its own feeling, and that's gonna that's gonna mingle with the feeling of the listener, and and create something new. But also the words themselves. Um, I've never studied poetry or anything, but I guess it's on on a level. Um, lyrics can be can be like poetry, you know, in in the way they in the way they sound, the way they flow the way they rhyme, um, the rhythm of everything. So that's always, I'm always trying to do something like that too, but, but maybe, maybe I always try to drop a word that, uh, it's just kind of, just kind of interesting or unexpected or, or just, just makes you feel something. Yeah. Well, I like that idea of sort of finding a quiet moment to yourself it's that same process of tuning out all this noise that we're surrounded yeah, by. Yeah. So you can sort of kind of hear your own ideas and yeah. follow them. I, I find that the more I um, disrupt, you know, the modern day in my world, it helps me. Mm -hmm. You know, like even coming down to the studio and just grabbing an acoustic guitar and getting up and sometimes I'll put the phone on, uh, sitting on the acoustic so that I can walk around the studio, mm -hmm. yeah. coming up with lyric ideas and just like pacing. Movement yeah. really helps with those things. Movement is is great, I find. You know, walking, um, driving sometimes, um, but definitely walking or uh, um, cleaning your studio, you know. Yeah. Some sort of physical activity. Uh, there's also a great practice that I got from The Artist Way. Are you familiar with that book? Um, I know the name, yeah. It's sort of like a workbook, and I haven't gone all the way through it, but one thing you'll encounter early in that book is um, something called the morning pages. And the morning pages are something you do in the morning, and you just kind of free write. So whatever comes to your mind, uh, you don't filter it. You can... Type it on a computer. You can write it with a pencil, whatever. Um, but you just write for three pages. Um, it may end up being a story. It may just be kind of gibberish. It may be a song. It may be kind of a conglomeration of all those three things. But what it does is it activates those parts of your brain, that muscle kind of, you know, like if you, if you want to be physically strong, you work out. And if you want to uh, be a sharp writer, you just write, 
and write and write. And don't worry about your ideas, you know, because inspiration will come. You want to be ready. You want to be sharp when the inspiration does come. Yeah. You know, you want, you want your, uh, just the, the tools to be in shape. And that's what like a daily uh, writing routine does. And, and I find it's true for like playing an instrument too, you know. Right. Just don't, like I mentioned about guitar. You play a little you, guitar every day. Your yeah. guitar chops are there when you need to play something good. Sure. Yeah. Just kind of improvise, just, just improvise for 30 minutes or whatever. And, and that will keep those parts of your brain, those parts of your soul in shape, I guess, because when ideas, when, when you, when you're struck with something that you do have strong feelings about, instead of feeling like, well, I just don't feel prepared, you know, sitting down and getting writer's block, uh, you'll be so lubricated, you know, that you're just kind of ready to go. Yeah. Well, I think that a good takeaway is reminding us that we need to give ourselves more permission to yeah. just chill out, just goof around. Goof around, yeah. Goof around. We don't give ourselves a lot of permission to do that uh -uh. In, in the world today, you mm -hmm. know, when there's something that needs to be done all the time. Um, all right, let's jump to our closing question. This one is hypothetical, and uh, we're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine. Yeah. Do, 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 do. You can make some <laughs> cool sound effect with your uh, synth record. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe we'll have some crystals in the video to accompany it. But mm -hmm. we'll go back in time. You go back in time and find young Cheyenne, who's a uh, playing guitar, thinking about coming to Nashville, or maybe you've just gotten here oh, yeah. and you're trying to make it work. And you say, listen, dude, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What, what advice would you like to go back and give yourself? That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, but I, but it, would, it would definitely... Well, you don't want to screw it up twice? <laughs> <laughs> it would definitely have something to do with like, uh, be more of a humble learner, like find mentors and don't feel like you have to, um, you, especially when you're starting out, but really at any point in your career, like you don't have to like um, measure up to people who have been doing it uh, longer than you or who are more successful than you. Just uh, be okay with not knowing everything. And um, and just definitely definitely still have your alone time and and um, you know your your time to play and and goof off and figure things out for yourself. But don't be afraid to share what you have for fear that it's, it's going to be judged or rejected. And definitely don't be afraid to uh, ask questions about people's process and ask for help. Um, there was, I'm, I'm looking for the name of it again, but the sharing process, there was a group that you mentioned, um, was it a songwriting group or something like that? Uh, the Real Sword Music Collective? Real Sword Music Collective, yeah. I don't know if that's an official name, but it's Real Sword is the name of uh, a record label that my friends Rob and Jay Griffith started. And it just kind of comes out of this loose collective of uh artists and songwriters and and producers just kind of a circle of friends so um about a year ago um Jay and Rob hosted a series of house concerts in my home studio in the departure room and they brought um we had like four to five acts a night for like five weekends in a row and and it was amazing. Like, like I met all these, uh, most mostly a lot younger than me, um, artists who are um, kind of starting out. But um, I mean, some have been doing it for a while. But um, just just a lot of just a lot of great energy, and and um, just through meeting a lot of these folks. Um, I've started kind of producing and, and mixing some stuff and co-writing some stuff for some of these people. And, um, and then Jay and Rob are, are kind of starting to help me release my own stuff as well. Yeah, so, and, and, they, and they do a zine, like an old-fashioned 
uh, rock zine. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm, I'm hoping we'll see more of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pieces. Well, that's cool. It's just that great reminder of like you know part of the process of getting and sharing, sharing and getting it out there is just simply participating. You know, just yeah. get out there and participate. Um, Cheyenne, thanks so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us, man. Thanks for having what me. What a pleasure. I mean, you know, I've known you for since I guess 2005 was right yeah. about the time, and, 14 and uh, years, yeah. you know, we hit the studio immediately as soon as as soon as we we met and you got here. Yeah, and um, you know, we've done. It was fun having you here for stereo, stereo sessions, and it's great to go listen back on to your catalog of of amazing songs and stuff. So. Wish you the best and um, look forward to you seeing best. you more around the studio. Let, let yeah. the Rockstars know how they can find you online now. Where can they go listen to your stuff? Okay. Um, uh, just my name, Cheyenne Metters, C-H-E-Y-E-N-N-E-M-E-D-D-E-R-S. I'm on Spotify, Apple Music, all those platforms. I'm on Bandcamp, uh, which is a cool platform for releasing music. Instagram, Facebook, it's just my name. So... Yeah. Right on, dude. Well, thanks for joining us, man. You're we'll, very we'll, welcome. We'll Thank see you. See you around the studio. We'll get together and do some writing. Soon. Alrighty. Yeah. All right, man. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Whisper Room, Spectra 1964, PreSonus Studio One, Jay-Z Microphones, United Plugins, bringing you Hyperspace, Royal Compressor, Fire Cobra, and Front Daw, and Audio Movers, helping stream high-quality audio directly from your studio. You will find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. So thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you guys in the next episode.